Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Nell Pepper, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to introduce this virtual event with David Salter, presenting his book, Music, Math, and Mind, The Physics and Neuroscience of Music. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community. Every week we host events here on our Zoom account and the rest of the month is chock full of author events, including a conversation with Jane Goodall and Peter Voleman, a presentation with neuroscientist David Eagleman and Carlo Rivelli in conversation with Katie Mack. Please check out the event schedule on our website at harvard.com slash events. And while you're there, you can sign up for our email newsletter for more updates. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our author at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we will get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I will post a link to purchase copies of Music, Math, and Mind on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and of our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. We thank you so much for showing up and tuning in, both in support of our authors in this series and of the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. And we truly appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. We, of course, hope they do not. But if they do, we will do our best to resolve them quickly. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. And now I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's author. David Solzer is a professor in the departments of psychiatry, neurology, and pharmacology at Columbia University Medical Center. He is also a composer and performer under the name David Dave Soldier and has worked with many major figures in the classical jazz and pop worlds. Some of his projects bridge music and neuroscience, including the Thai Elephant Orchestra, an orchestra of 14 elephants in Northern Thailand, and the Brainwave Music Project, which uses EEGs of brain activity to create compositions. Tonight, he will discuss his new book, Music, Math, and Mind, The Physics and Neuroscience of Music. This book offers a lively exploration of the mathematics, physics, and neuroscience that underlie music in a way that readers without scientific background can follow. David Sulzer makes accessible a vast range of material, helping readers discover the universal principles behind the music they find meaningful. Library Journal praises with his whimsical philosophical deep dive into the musical interplay of science and mathematics, Solzer draws on his dual roles. Each chapter unfolds with theory, history, mathematical notation, and riveting storytelling. I am honored to turn things over to tonight's speaker. The digital podium is yours, David. Okay, uh, wonderful, Nora. And, uh... Thanks uh, to you and to Lauren and the other people who invite me. And I'm thrilled that you're going to have Jane Goodall. You're actually going to have a conversation with Jane Goodall while she's in Africa, it sounds like. And please email me that one. I, I definitely want to be there for that. Uh, speaking of which, uh, with any luck, we have Sue Savage Rumba also here. And I think she'll be available for the Q&A. At least I hope so. And uh, uh, you'll see some of her work uh, coming up in a few minutes. So uh, I appreciate that, you know, I'm calling this lecture, if you will, today, Music, Math, and Mind, but I'm not really exactly talking about the book. I thought it might be more fun and interesting and whimsical. Apparently I'm whimsical. I had no idea. So, um, or, or my personality's went, I don't know what it was. I was glad to hear that actually. Um, and I, I thought it would be more fun for us to go over a couple of kind of questions. Here they are. This is what my portion will be before our Q&A, before our discussion. Uh, two questions. Do other species hear music like we do? And to not put you in suspense, I'm going to say, yeah, they kind of probably do, especially if they have an auditory cortex. And uh, I'll go into some detail about why I think that. And the other one 
and you, you've already heard a sort of a giveaway with the Thai Elephant Orchestra. Can other species play musical instruments? And I'm going to say yes. So we're going to talk about these two questions. Now for the first one, oh, technical problem already. Here we go. Um, some, the first few slides here, for those of you who are engineers and physicists and mathematicians, uh, the first few slides are, are going to be a little slow for you, but stick with us. I promise that in a few slides, you'll be on some information that you, you have not seen before. But to bring those of you who are not professional physicists up to speed, I'm sure you hear uh, people speak about sound waves. Uh, that's what we hear. And what does that mean? I mean, these are waves in the air. And it's kind of hard to imagine what waves in the air are. Unfortunately, waves in the uh, ocean, you go up to Newburyport or Rhode Island or something, if for all those of you in Boston, and uh, jump in the ocean, you can feel the waves as they push and they pull you back towards the shore, you know, the undertow and so on. And, and this air waves and water waves have some similarities and that will help us think about those invisible waves in the air. Of course, the air waves, uh, uh, the water waves you can hear, right? Why do you hear them? Because they're pushing the air back and forth. Um, now, if the water, if these water waves were fast enough, you, you would hear, you would hear a tone in the air. Uh, where's that tone? Well, for our species, we begin to hear about 20 hertz. That means per second, anything per second is a hertz. One, one hertz means one event per second. So uh, for us, we begin to hear uh, waves and periodic repeating waves, meaning that they have um, a sort of reproducible space between each of the waves here, the water waves. Of course, water waves are really about one a second or less. But if, you, if they were 20 hertz, if you had 20 a second, which you might get close to with the little ripples of, of a lot of wind on a little pool, you would start to hear a tone and it would be a very low tone, the lowest we can hear. Elephants can hear about an octave below that, which you'll understand in a second, a few seconds, is half of this, an octave is, is half the frequency. So they can hear about to 10 Hertz. If we are, um, uh, say teenagers, we can hear up to about 20,000 Hertz uh, my age, I can hear 15,000 hertz. That sounds like a big loss, but actually it's only a loss of a few notes on, on say, on a piano keyboard. And we use up to about 4,000 hertz um, in music. There are overtones that go over this, but even a very high piccolo note um, is not really much more than about 4,000 hertz. And um, that's about the, the height, that's about as high as we get on piano. So let's look at this wave. So we can say there's a wave length, that's the distance between uh, the top of two waves or the bottom of two waves. Amplitude in a water wave is measured from a midpoint to the trough of the wave or up to the crest of the wave. And one of the interesting things here, this is, by the way, drawings that I'm going to show you are by Lisa Haney, very talented musician and, as you can see, artist. And uh, Lisa is showing a little toy boat here. The idea with the toy boat is you can imagine that in the ocean, it might be bobbing up and down but mostly neither moving towards the, the uh, shore nor moving away from the shore. Um, so the molecules are in the water are moving, but they're not necessarily, uh, this molecule is not necessarily moving towards the shore. What, they, what they're doing is having uh, this transient activity where many water molecules are sort of pushed together. Now water is hard to compress, so when you do that, you get a high point of a wave. And when they're moving towards that, of course, that leaves some of these areas with fewer water molecules and, and it's shorter. So think about that, but now let's transfer to the air. Now air, unlike water, is pretty easy to compress, right? You know, I can compress air right there. So uh, imagining air waves that are carrying sound was a big challenge for people for a long time. Um, and one of, the big, one of the really helpful steps was in the 1700s with the invention of the siren. 
So uh, it's credited to a couple of people, but uh, particularly to uh, Charles de la Tour, who invented the modern siren. And it's the same kind of siren that, uh, that was used in, um, in ambulances and police cars and so on. And the way a siren works is you have a spinning disc and then you have some air like this fellow with the bellows pushing some air through the disc. So you can see as the disc turns, if there's a hole, the air is gonna go there. Uh, this is high pressure air and it's gonna go through here and escape. And as the disc turns, now uh, this next area is blocked until the next hole. hole. So you're gonna have the spurt of high pressure followed by low pressure, followed by high pressure and so on. So the frequency, the uh, where the note is, it, it, for musicians, the pitch of the note um, can be controlled by how fast this fellow is turning the siren. And that's why when you hear a siren, you, when it starts, it goes up and mm, and when it goes down, mm, because of the change in the speed. Um, of course, you could also have one hole or you can have many holes. So let's say we had one hole um, that was turning 440 times a second. That would be um, a, a frequency of 440 hertz. And I mentioned that number because that happens to be this note, which is there's a little piano keyboard and you, you're not seeing in front of my uh, computer. And um, this note is the note that the oboe uses to tune to uh, when an orchestra is tuning up. So, uh, or that's for if you spun 440 times. Well, if you had 10 holes and were blowing air through it, you could um, just have uh, 44 RPM or revolutions per, well, no, per second, actually. And that would give you the same uh, pitch because there would be 44 uh, peaks of high pressure. Now, this I understand is taking a lot of stuff just on sort of, you, you have to trust me. I don't want you just to trust me. This is an experiment that you can do in your classroom at home to uh, demonstrate this to you. And it's making these waves into so-called standing waves. Now this is used in music too, especially some uh, contemporary experimental music. I, I'm a fan and friend of a fellow named Phil Niblock who's been doing this for years. You can hear this in Phil's music if you ever go to one of his concerts, but he plays you know, a note that might go on, the whole piece might have a note that goes on for an hour, but you know, subtly changes. But you can do this with a speaker. Now, a speaker is pushing and pulling the air. If you play a low enough note with the low enough frequency, you can see it. You can see that as the speaker moves out, it's pushing the air in the room, and as it moves back in, it's pulling the air. So you could see how that would make this high pressure. And if you do this with a wall, what will happen, at, depending upon the frequencies, it will bounce back and you'll start getting waves that reinforce each other and also um, reinforce each other in a negative way. So you get high pressure followed by low pressure and you get other ones where there's uh, no change at all. Um, this is the term that physicists use. It goes back to Lord Raleigh. But what the point here is that if you have this high pressure, you can stand over here and get in some areas and it will be quite loud and you can be in other areas where there's little change in air pressure and over there you, you it's going to be quieter so you can demonstrate this to yourself in a, in a nice physical way that there must be actual waves in the air and as you change the pitch or the frequency of the note in the speaker you'll, you'll change this as well so this is all actually leading somewhere that will um, tell you about how we hear and how other animals might hear. Next stage in trying to convince you about this comes from Pythagoras. Uh, Pythagoras never actually wrote anything. We have to rely on us, much like Jesus with the Gospels. We have to rely on what his followers said, but he, he, lived, in, uh, he lived in Sicily uh, when it essentially also had a Greek, uh, uh, you know, when people spoke Greek in, in, in Sicily. And um, he would try to figure out the, the math of, of music with the idea that it's probably explained by a very small numbers that are very rational and the whole universe would make sense. So we can do this. I have, I, I'll do this on a guitar over here, but it's the same thing. 
as him, he's using a single string, so that's called a monochord. And it's how uh, the Greeks tried to figure out uh, the physics of the scale. So you take one string, say this is a monochord string over here. And one thing I'll ask students is, how can you, without a ruler, figure out if you're in the exact middle of, a, uh, uh, of the string? And so the way you can do this is uh, by listening, by, by fretting, or, or in this case, he's moving, you see this movable bridge. And if you move it right to the middle, you're going to have the same note on one side. Whoops. There we go. So that should be the same there. If it's not, that, that means that we can do it with harmonic. So you hear here, this pitch is the same as this pitch. So this is the exact middle of the string. Um, now, he, what happens if you divide the string not in half, but in thirds? And we'll use the harmonic again. And we get this note. So this note is, if we use the, the terminology you all, you've all learned, do, re, mi, fa, so. So sol is one third. And then the next, uh, one, uh, the next harmonic that's going to come up is with one fourth. This is actually differing a little bit. This is with uh, a bridge that's different than uh, producing a harmonic. Uh, we can get a major third over here. And so from this one string, you can begin to hear the so-called harmonic series. Now, this series is made of what I just played was the full string, half the string, a third of the string, a quarter of the string. And you can keep uh, going up and up with this dividing the string into smaller and smaller parts. Strings actually do this. Well, you just heard the string do it. But it's, it's happening whenever you vibrate a string. It's not only uh, vibrating according to the length of the whole string, but to these nice uh, one halves, one thirds, one quarters. And uh, all these are actually built into the sound. You don't notice them, but it gives the personality of the, of the sound to an instrument which uh, harmonics are added like the ingredients in a recipe. So the harmonics are whole note multiples of these frequencies. So if this were 440 Hertz, if you divide it in half and do that harmonic that I just did, then it's uh, the, the next pitch is twice the frequency, 440 times two, it's 880 Hertz. That is one octave higher. So 440 is over here and then 880, is over here, okay? And then uh, two thirds of that uh, is going to give you, or uh, yeah, two thirds of that is gonna give you the uh, major third and you're gonna get this chord that you've listened to your entire life, but um, now you know that it's just simply multiples of the frequency. So it was very exciting to the ancient Greeks to realize if you had one half the string, well, now you do the reciprocal instead of one over two, you turn it upside down, it's two over one, and that's the frequency. And they said, wow, this is great. And if you take two thirds of the string and move it upside down, it's three halves the frequency, that's the fifth. Gee, you can describe music in very small, easily understood whole numbers. The world makes sense. This is wonderful. It didn't last very long. That didn't last very long. <laughs> But this lasted for a long time. So how long have we been using these kinds of scales? Because we're talking about, what about other animals? Well, let's first look at, our, uh, at old humans. So this is a replica of the oldest flute that's been discovered. There were about four of these flutes found. It's also in caves in Southern Germany that have our first uh, uh, longest lasting examples of figurative art and small sculptures. Um, so this is a flute made from a, uh, a crane uh, bone. Bird bones are good for this because they can survive 35,000 years and also because they're hollow. So uh, this, these, this flute comes from a group that's so old that one of the flutes is made from mammoth tusk. So it was made definitely when mammoths were still roaming uh, Southern Germany. So Wolf Hein is a fellow in Germany that likes to reconstruct uh, these instruments and uh, because most of them are broken, not a surprise. And when he put it back together, 
he could see that the holes on here are playing a pentatonic scale. It happens to be this. So this is the still scales that you, right, that you hear in music all the time these days. Other ones for the musicians here are in the standard five note pentatonic scale. So we've been doing this for a long time, at least since, as far as we know, we've been able to make instruments. Okay, we're gonna go a little bit deeper into this now. So we, let's take all these frequencies and start adding them together. Um, let's take one of these frequencies, let's say this is A440. In fact, with the, if I did this right, the, these, these are milliseconds, thousands of seconds. So this should be A440. And let's do that higher octave, which remember would be 440 times two, and we get 880. And then we get uh, the third uh, one, which is if you, I said this quickly, three halves of the frequency of this one. And so we should be hearing, let's see, uh, we should be hearing here and here and here, and then here, and then finally up here. Okay, and now, how do you add waves together? Well, it's easy. It's just like water waves. If there are two waves on top of each other, they add. And if there are two waves that are, are negative, well, they essentially subtract and you get, you get a lower, you get a, a trough, you get a peaks, you get the peaks and you get the troughs. Um, and so that's pretty easy to do. And what you end up getting when you have that very standard uh, chord that you grew up with is a, a, a very nice repeating sort of periodic wave, right? It's very, very simple. But now let's start adding some dissonant notes. Now this is a very classic dissonant note. It's instead of, right, which is the note we heard before, it's this one, it's on the piano. And this happens to be exactly in the half of the octave. So if you take this act, oct this octave and divide it in two, you don't get this, you get this, this. Now this sounds a little more dissonant, but in fact, it is the basis of the entire corpus of classical music from the Baroque onwards and of the whole American songbook, you know, Gershwin and uh, George M. Cohen and everybody, Earth, Wind and Fire and everybody that uses fancy chords. The whole thing is about how to resolve these kind of notes to these. And you're in, you're in uh, Boston, so all the people at Manhattan School and Berkeley School of Music all know about two five chords, and we won't get into that, but that's the basis. But it's interesting that it comes up from dividing the octave exactly in half. It's the square root of two, because these are logarithmic. That's just for math people. Um, it's, uh, it's the thing that really gave a terrible headache to Pythagoras and his people. Anyway, let's add these two together. And what happens? Instead of this kind of nice, uh, very simple repeating pattern, we start to get much more complex patterns with peaks that are you know, not showing up so regularly. We can also add notes that are very close to each other. And now you can see that some of them, this is uh, the same note, and this is one that's just detuned a little bit just a little bit. And you can see that sometimes they line up and you get uh, this reinforcement, but other times they cancel each other out. So you can see not only is there such a thing as sound, but there's also a thing called anti-sound where the sound goes away. We, we talked about that in that little experiment you can do in the room. Um, so this is the principle for noise cancellation uh, headphones but you, you can put these two waves together, put them out a little far apart and you start to get this disappearance of the sound called beats. I'll play them for you very shortly and you'll hear that they're, they're real. Now, if we keep adding more and more detuned harmonics, they're no longer harmonics. What we're getting is more and more beats. And you remember, look at how these, this is the same uh, uh, frequencies you added before, but just detuned a little bit and now, that pattern becomes very noisy. And in fact, this is what we call noise. Okay, uh, let's, let's hear a little bit of this before we, uh, we keep talking. So this is a free program, it's called Audacity. So those of you that are interested in this, uh, just download it and you can hear it. Now, first we're gonna play a 440 Hertz wave. 
It's just a circular wave going uh, up and down and up and down. It's, that's called a sine wave. And it's really boring. And you'll hear why we don't like to use sine waves too much in, in music. Let's hear it over here. Boring. So uh, that's 440 hertz that A, the oboe tones to. Now let's add the lower octave. So we take 440 hertz divided by two, that's 220 hertz. They should reinforce each other if you're following me. They, every other, every other uh, uh, peak and trough should reinforce each other. Will they sound consonant? Obviously. They so boring, a little less boring perhaps, but consonant sound. Well, let's add that other one, which is three halves of the, the you know, sort of the fifth. It's, it's actually this note, that note, right? And let's hear the three of them together. Uh, I want to unmute, don't I? I hope I unmute. Let's do that. If you will, nice but boring, uh, uh, very simple chord. That that chord has been played, as you saw, even uh, uh, thirty-five thousand years ago. Now let's detune a little bit. This is four hundred and forty hertz. Now let's make it a tiny little bit faster. In fact, it's so much you probably can't even hear the and say this. This is all stuff that. Right, they sound pretty much like the same note, but let's play them together. Are those beats every time it goes quiet? When it's going quiet, that's the noise cancellation, or rather, that's the cancellation. Those are the beats. And how far are they away from each other? Well, if I did this right, you should be able to count that speed, that frequency, as eight per second and that now just to make this a little more complicated and get a full chord and start to see what noise means we're going to detune to be more interesting. Uh, so, but we are definitely getting towards noise, right? Because this certainly is starting to sound a little more disturbing than if we simply are using. So I know all of you can hear that, whether you're quote musical or you're, or you're not, you're, you're all hearing that difference. And, uh, I'm going to say animals do that too, and you'll see why very shortly. Uh, I do want to mention that there are different kinds of noises that have to do with the non-harmonic frequencies that you add. Uh, this one, white noise, this is made by uh, Jay Jeffries, who also contributed art to the book. And uh, the frequency is like these white, it's sort of a, this, whether you're in low notes over here or high notes over here, the distribution is about the same. There's also pink noise, which falls off so that there's more in the lower range and the brown noise, which uh, even more in the lower part and less in the higher part. And this white noise has the sound of shh, you know, snow on your TV, if you remember, if you go back that far. And uh, whereas these have a sort of more relaxing feel and people sometimes use them as, as sleeping aids. Okay, finally getting to the animals. So these are recordings from the auditory nerve happens to be of a cat. And this recording was made by a fellow who used to be at Harvard, we were all up in Boston, uh, named Dr. Mark Tramo. Now uh, Mark is a professor out in California, he's a neurologist. And he um, is recording from the nerves that run from the ear into the brain, the auditory nerve. There's about 30,000 um, axons running in the auditory nerve. And what he did was he played these intervals. So this interval down here is the same one we've been playing all day. That actually, yeah, this interval. Okay. And what happens in the, um, in, in the activity of this auditory nerve in this, uh, this is an anesthetized cat. So the cat's unconscious. 
but still responding to sound. And you could see these very periodic peaks that are showing up over here. And uh, so uh, this should be reminiscent of the waves you've been looking at. Uh, quickly for the musicians, if you use a fourth, oh, sorry, you're going to hear something, uh, you're going to see something very similar with these periodic waves. Now let's go to that tritone, which is that, that note when you cut the octave exactly in half, right? That, that, that one that we use to base uh, so much music on, right? We, we always want to resolve that in traditional, um, uh, traditional songs and, and classical music. Um, that now this starts to get much more complicated, much like the waves that you were seeing in, in the air. So it, this, is, this is already telling us that for a cat, that the processing in the, uh, uh, between the ear and into the brain is very similar to what we have and what we see, not just in brain recordings, but actually out in the air. So a lot of what we talk about with consonants and dissonance is, is not really neuronal, even though our neurons uh, end up uh, perceiving it and understanding it and classifying it. It's really stuff that's in physics. It's in the way that harmonics and multiples work. Um, just a little more biology here, and then we'll get to the animal music. Um, so where do we recognize that the sounds are consonant and dissonant? Well, that's probably mostly happening in this little area in the cortex over here called the auditory stratum. This was discovered by a uh, surgeon in Montreal, Wilder Penfield. Uh, he's a wonderful writer. He wrote back from the 30s up until the 70s. Um, and he was a brain, like I said, he was a brain surgeon doing surgery on people with intractable epilepsy. Uh, we still do this kind of surgery for people who have, uh, some people have epilepsy. And he would use electrodes and uh, he would uh, give uh, small shocks to different parts of the brain. And if you, if you do it in, in this area, you end up, uh, the, the, who's ever having the surgery, will end up hearing sounds. So uh, you've probably seen this. This is Penfield's drawings of the homunculus. And there's an auditory uh, region over here. But this side, uh, sensory homunculus, you know, if he's over here, you'll say, ah, I can feel something on my lips. Over here, I can feel something on my elbow. Um, if you're just a little to the side of that, you're in a motor area where if, uh, if you stimulate over here, you're going to move muscles in the neck over here on the index finger, etc. So these kinds, uh, as I just mentioned, these kinds of operations are still going on uh, and they're very, very similar. The biggest difference is probably that now uh, when Penfield was doing it, he could only use a single electrode. Now we're using multiple electrodes. So this is work from a lab at Columbia. Uh, the fellow's name is Nima Mescurani. And uh, what Nima was doing here was speaking a, uh, a sentence and the sentences and what eyes they were and finding out where, uh, where in this auditory cortical area um, there was responses to each of the phonemes. You know, what, I, th, they, were. And finding out precisely where in the different parts of the auditory cortex there was response to these different kinds of sounds. This has advanced so much, and this is going to be very helpful eventually for uh, uh, people who have uh, deafness, or at least some people, um, that they, could, they can reconstruct what that person is hearing from just recording the electrical activity. And they can go through that and say, ah, well, if it's this neuron, it must be this sound. And um, this helps to reconstruct what's, what someone has actually heard. So here is another similar experiment where there's a cortical recording. And in the three dimensions here, Nima is figuring out this area is responding to and this one to and this area to, you know, so different parts of the cortex responding to different sounds. But is this, this a human? No, this is a ferret. This is a recording from a ferret cortex. So they're responding to human spoken phonemes. Now, ferrets did not evolve to understand us. And yet they are processing sounds the same way that we are. Uh, Nima's lab and some other labs are starting to do this with music as well. And it seems to 
uh, uh, again, be uh, quite similar, at least at this early stage of these kind of investigations. So do other animals hear like we do? If you've been following me and you followed that last slide, I'm gonna say, yeah. Now the frequency ranges can be very different. We, we run from about 10, uh, 20 Hertz up to about 20,000. Uh, elephants uh, about an octave lower, some whales even lower than that. Bats can hear up to uh, uh, about 200,000 kilohertz, which is about three octaves higher than we hear. So frequency ranges can be very different. But the harmonies and this idea of consonants and dissonance, I hope I convinced you are built on physical properties. And so um, from the available information right now, I believe that they look to be retained at least for animals with an auditory cortex. Now, there are plenty of other animals, you know, do insects here the same way, do shellfish, et cetera. Um, is this common to all uh, animals that feel vibrations? If a moth is communicating by vibrating a leaf to another moth, is it perceived in the same way? Do they hear harmonies and dissonance and consonants? No, uh, I, I don't know at this point, but I think we could say it's looking like if you have a cortex and in particular a part of the cortex to respond to sound, Yes, they're probably hearing the same way, way we are. So I know I've been talking too much, so I'm gonna go over this very quickly. Can other animals play instruments? Uh, here's a zebra finch that's triggering an, an instrument. This uh, was with Ofer Chernovsky that developed this. Notice the shell feathers. This, uh, uh, Ofer figured out that zebra finches, uh, an Australian bird will hit this uh, little instrument, if you will, um, maybe hundreds of times an hour sometimes to uh, hear the sounds of other zebra finches, as particularly their father. So with a couple of uh, friends, we said, well, will they also play these levers to hear uh, other, other birds or even other human-made music? And I'll give you some examples here. If you go to my website, you can hear them more fully. Here's zebra finches. <laughs> As they're playing, so in a way they are, I don't think it's even in a way, they're composing music. Here they are playing gamelan. Some, some sounds uh, they like to play and it will trigger them sometimes. Other ones they'll avoid and there's certain times of day that they like playing more than others. Okay, so questions for uh, songbirds. We'd like to continue this. We're hoping to uh, do some of this with, at MIT uh, with uh, people that are interested in that kind of thing. And I, I thank Irene Pepperberg, who's sort of the world's parrot expert, might be in the audience and we can talk to her, I hope. Um, but there, we'd like to develop this uh, even for wild birds. I, I think some species like mockingbirds may have wider taste in what they will play. Um, I want to play a little bit of uh, the work that Sue Savage Rumba and the musician Peter Gabriel did. Um, those of you that know Sue's work know that she, she's been uh, living and working with uh, bonobos for many years. And here's Kanzi, who's one of them, uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, bonobos that she's uh, worked with for many decades. And behind here, you'll see it later, that's a special part. See, you hear the singing behind that? That's Peter Gabriel playing uh, a synthesizer behind this uh, behind the screen. And Peter is playing for the musicians. He's mostly playing kind of D minor chords, and you can hear him sing along with it. And what is Kanzi doing here? Uh, nobody ever taught him how to do this, but he found that's an octave, right? That's for the musicians. He's playing a ninth. He's playing a D. He's playing a variety of other notes, most of which tend to be consonant um, and following a logic. Uh, later, he'll start doing some Henry Call stuff with uh, playing uh, groups of notes. But well, nobody do, uh, is doing this. There we go. There's some Henry Call piano playing. Um, and this is, uh, these are fascinating uh, videos to watch. So uh, bonobos will play musical instruments. Um, finally, we're going to end here with the Thai elephant orchestra. This is, these are elephants that live in the Thai elephant conservation center, the first conservation center 
in Thailand. Now there's about 100. This one's run by the government. It's founded by the government. And particularly involved in this was Richard Lair. Now, if you've heard of the painting elephants, these are the same elephants that uh, began painting. Uh, that's another story. It's here. This is a picture of the, uh, of the conservation center. It's in Teak Forest in uh, Northern Thailand. And here are the instruments that we made over the years. And uh, we made a bunch of uh, successful instruments. This is just to show you that the math that I used to build these instruments uh, together with a fellow named Sackhorn, who lives in Langpang, who's a metal worker. And we built uh, many of these instruments. Here's one of them. And uh, the, we chose the lengths of these metal tubes in order to play harmonic notes that we think would be pleasing to elephants, not just people. And on top of that, for the people, we wanted specific people because it's most important that the local Thai people um, enjoy the music and enjoy the elephants uh, doing the music for, for a variety of conservation reasons. So uh, I mostly chose notes that would mirror the, uh, the music that's played in that part of Thailand. It's, it's called Lana. And so the, the Lana music, which tends to be pentatonic. So uh, of course they will play drums it only takes them about five minutes to learn an instrument. And after that, they improvise. Uh, Lee Oscar, the harmonica builder, kindly gave us some very nice uh, harmonicas of which they love to play. And uh, they'll play this even walking in the forest sometimes. And uh, these are tuned to the Lana scale. Uh, these are some other instruments we built that play uh, chords. Uh, these are angalooms, which are traditional Thai instruments. And we'll just watch a few minutes of this. You can see the whole thing on, I'll just arbitrarily start over here and we'll watch. This is 14 elephants here. Here's Richard, whoops. I didn't, I really didn't want to stop showing that. We can have a minute of it at least. Let's see, let's just play from. This is Chapat, fell by his big cat. Oh, uh, I mean, sorry. <laughs> Delvice big time. Um, he's playing a bass instrument. So you can see the many, many of these And the elephants here are improvising. We will tell them when to stop and start, but beyond that, we're really not telling them anything. And they've recorded three CDs, and there have been recordings of, uh, there have been transcriptions that I and other people have done of the elephants improvising, scoring them professional musicians. By the way, here are two humans playing rain sticks. We could never get the elephant. This is one of the only failures of elephant instruments. We could never get them to uh, turn rain sticks over. So we have, uh, we have uh, human beings playing the rain sticks. All the other sounds are being improvised by the elephants. Okay, so uh, end of question two, because I know we, we gotta get to discussion. Will other species play musical instruments? Yes, at least for songbirds, uh, bonobos. Also, Gordon Shaw and I, in a different way, tried to teach uh, bonobos to play music, which they did, but not as successfully as Sue and uh, Sue Savage Rumba and Peter Gabriel. Elephants, uh, but we're only scratching the surface. Uh, wild birds, I mentioned. If I think the point is the instruments must be ergonomic and going to question one. They have to produce attractive sounds for the other species. Okay, that's really uh, the two questions I wanted to go through today. There's a little bit of discussion on conservation, but let's open it up and I'm going to stop sharing. And I, I hope I didn't lose people too much and that you in, in, enjoyed this. And if you disagree with me, that's fine. That's science. And we'll be happy to be happy to go with any questions or discussion. Thank you so much. This was Fantastic. Uh, and uh, we we have lots of good questions here from folks. Uh, let me see if I can. I, by the way, do not have chat. So you'll have to read the questions to me. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm happy to. Um, so Robert Hahn asks a couple of questions that uh, gets to kind of the center of just what we all hear when we're hearing music. So his first question, uh, what what does resolve, like chord resolution, or what, is, what does resolve really mean? Why does it feel right? Um, and uh, he's curious also about the, the video in the, with the elephant improvising. How do you assess 
elephant aesthetics? How do you assess what they are finding beautiful or ugly? Okay, first, uh, 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 well, actually, very first is 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 Sue here? Is Sue? Did Sue Let me check. She was to... not oh. last I saw. Okay. All right. So then I won't throw any uh, questions uh, yeah. her way. No. So let's talk a little bit about the idea of resolve. Resol resolution, to some extent, is culturally uh, learned. So here is a flamenco chord. If you're a flamenco fan, you've heard this chord a million times. <laughs> Guitar's a little, a little out of tune, but I'm not going to take the time to tune it. But this chord, right? Now, for the musicians in, in, that are sitting there, that chord is an E major chord with an F natural on it. This is considered to be if this were in Bach or most um, most American popular music or European popular music, that would be considered a, a dissonant chord and has to resolve. But in fact, it's for flamenco music, it, it actually does resolve. There. Right? And uh, flamencos who are into it uh, will tell you that's a, a Phrygian scale and it's supposed to end there. Okay, mm -hmm. but it's not a ending that you would ever use in uh, uh, in Western music that is not flamenco, and that's partly because you know flamenco music comes uh, from the Middle East and from India and so on. Um, so a lot of that is is cultural, but there, but but I think you can say that there are also physical reasons. Uh, where we feel that this is just the same chord that we went through with the sine waves. So this is a boring chord, right? But we feel that, that we feel that it has, it has uh, gravity. If it were the flamenco chord, the same, uh, the one that we just heard, it would essentially be, right? Which, which sounds spicy to us, but does not necessarily sound like it resolves. And the one that I played now is the one, it's actually the one that, I played with all those uh, sine waves. Uh, truth to tell, I detuned, if you remember some of the sine waves, but that's the same chord, okay? So what, where we feel resolution in uh, a lot of ways is culturally defined. Um, the, if it weren't, we'd be walking around content to hear sine waves of, of, of perfect multiples all the time, and we're not. We find that really boring. So this is um, a lot of the magic in music is using the noise, using the dissonance. So when people build uh, African instruments like gilis, if you're familiar with it, the African xylophones, they'll take gourds in order on purpose to add noise. Mm -hmm. Or if you're a tenor saxophone player, uh, you'll play, uh, you know, this. Uh, if you're a tenor saxophone player playing in like the style of King Curtis or an R&B player, you don't want to just do this. You want to do a bit of that. And why do we have Louis Armstrong and Holland Wolf and Tom Waits singing the way they do? There's all sorts of reasons that we want to bring uh, a bit of noise and dissonance into the music. We feel that it gives uh, uh, spice the same way that you would put together ingredients for a recipe. So I don't know if I actually answered uh, his question, the way, but that it, for me, that's an answer. It's, mm -hmm. there's a, it's a mixture of what's built into the air and vibrations and simple numbers and how we, our tastes, uh, and I don't think it's just our taste, um, serve to uh, try to modulate that. I actually did this with, the, with one of the elephants once, built a simple pentatonic um, a scale at, uh, on one of those xylophones. Uh -huh. And she started playing it and she was happy. And then I put one dissonant note that absolutely did not, did not work. And she hit it and would not hit it again. But then about 10 minutes later, because she kept playing, she went back to it and hit it over and over and over again. <laughs> so it was as, as if she had discovered dissonance herself, because there's no reward for this other than hearing the sound. The elephant is playing because it wants to hear the sound. Maybe it wants to please you a bit too, you know, but we do, humans do that too, right? right. We, we do things to please other people and uh, we do things for ourselves. And uh, it, it was if 
she discovered uh, dissonance in her own musical instrument. So I would say that's another one where we're not that different than, uh, than other species, perhaps. Man, oh, that's so great. Um, here's an interesting, I love this question. Someone asks, an anonymous attendee asks, could anti-sound be used to treat tinnitus? Uh, uh, yes, it could be used. There, there, are about, there are many different kinds of tinnitus. Mm. And some of them happen in the ear and some of them happen deeper in, in for instance, in the auditory cortex. There, if for people with tinnitus, and this is extremely common. In fact, uh, uh, one of my guides in understanding how the ear works is Professor Lisa Olson, Elizabeth Olson, who's uh, um, at Columbia University. You should bring her on to this one day to discuss how, um, how the physics of the ear. Yeah. And she tells me, because she has a silent room, an, an, an echoic room, I'm, if I pronounce that right, oh. um, that essentially anybody older than the age of 50 actually has tinnitus because you hear, but you don't hear it because it's, it's so quiet. You have to be in a very quiet place, mm -hmm. but you're hearing sounds that aren't there. There are many uh, causes for this. There are numerous different treatments. I had a good friend who was a professional musician who just stopped smoking pot and it got a lot better, but that was for him. It's not for most people. And, uh, but depending upon the kind of tinnitus, and it is frequent, especially, unfortunately, for professional musicians who play music a lot to develop this. Mm -hmm. And for some of them, uh, you may, if you were able to time it correctly, you may be able to use noise cancellation. On the other hand, I don't think it's been explored that much. Typically, they try drugs and uh, exercises and, and some other approaches. Mm -hmm. But I would definitely, if you have tinnitus, you know, see an audiologist see what they can do. But that, but I, but that anonymous person has a, a, is, is on the mark. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that this is a question that came pretty early in the talk. And I mean, you, you went into it certainly, but um, uh, Adrian asks, can an organism that lacks consciousness discern music in a similar way that we can, or what do, do you see consciousness as having a role in music perception? It's a big question. <laughs> okay, this is one that I would really like Sue to take on. Mm. And also, I don't know if Peter Pesek is here. He said he might be here. He's writing books on music and consciousness. Mm. Uh, for, for me, uh, Peter or Sue, if you can jump in, that would be great. Um, the uh, uh, consciousness is a field where I find people become quite lost. And I haven't really, so the question that Adrian asked um, is what about animals without consciousness? And I, it's hard for me to determine that there would be animals without consciousness. And I think one of the, one of the subtexts we have here with these animals playing music or whales singing, for instance, that we didn't uh, get into is the idea. Now, I know that you guys are in Boston. You have Noam Chomsky up there and he's saying other animals don't have consciousness. I, I don't buy that. I have, you know, respect for his, a lot of his political ideas and so on, but I, I, I don't see that. I think we're often, ex I mean, it should trouble us. Us biologists, uh, people doing biomedical research. We are using animals because they are so similar to us. Mm. And uh, to say, for some reason, we have consciousness, and that was developed, like Julian Jaynes said, consciousness was developed in a certain particular time in evolution, like 35,000 years ago or something. Um, I think that that's, frankly, I think that's making something up. And I don't know how, so the reason I can't answer Adrian's question is because it would take a while for us to define what it means for species that didn't have consciousness. So this is very yeah. hard for me to do. Um, I've not succeeded at this myself. Are did either Sue or Peter pop up here? I'm 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 checking in with Peter. Um, and I haven't I haven't okay. heard. Okay. All right. All right. Well, if they show up, then they. Can <laughs> You can try to field Adrian's question as well. I realize, Adrian, I avoided your question. 
Um, all right, let me see here. Um, a couple of questions about language. Let me see here. Oh, okay. Um, there's another pretty meaty question, but I think I think we'll probably have to wrap it up with this. Um, Helena asks, um, can you talk about uh, various cultures around the world that make music in uh, scales that aren't considered tonal in the Western scale? Um, and do, do these kinds of musical traditions, do they all work within the overtone series? Um, is the concept of kind of dissonance and consonance, is that is that something that translates across all human cultures uh, and just does and it even translate across it differently? Yeah. So uh, I'll say, uh, I, I'd say how from uh, my, you know, trying to examine this, um, essentially all the musical cultures are using octaves and fifths. So at least those overtones show up in essentially all musical cultures. Now there's a couple of exceptions I understand that there are two gamelan tunings that don't do that. Mm. Um, I, I have not heard those particular gamelans. Now, gamelans, by virtue of being metal instruments, already have, each, each time you hit one, you have the harmonic series. Okay. So you are still, even in a gamelan orchestra, uh -huh. you, you're hearing natural harmonic series. Um, but when they, some, some of the, uh, apparently two, at least two of the, the traditional tuning systems don't necessarily use octaves and fifths. The other exception I'm aware of, it was done on purpose by Wendy Carlos. Oh, okay. Switched on Bach fame. Uh-huh. So she developed a couple of tuning systems. I think she calls them alpha and beta systems which make nice music, but don't use, uh, uh, don't use octaves. I don't remember if they use fifths. And so she divided it up and um, because Wendy is a very good composer and often good composers like to work with constraints, mm -hmm. all different kinds of chains uh, uh, to you know, uh, challenge themselves and develop something beautiful within a series of rules. Uh, she can come up with very good music with this. So um, I gave you a very fast lesson in how to do this. And I would say to, I, I'm sorry, I just spaced her name out. Uh, was it Ursula? Uh, Helena. Helena. So Helena, if you're interested in this, I would say uh, I kind of gave you the rules to do this. Now, uh, if there are more rules, uh, I guess you can email me and I can, well, actually, this is my only plug for Harvard Bookstore. If you want to buy my book from Harvard Bookstore, the money's not going to me. It's going to go to the publisher, but it's going to go to Harvard Bookstore. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but, you know, that's that's my only ad. Other, if it was just me, I don't care if you steal the book, <laughs> right? But but um, no, really, I don't. But but the, but for Harvard Bookstore, I do care. So uh, you can go into more detail about how you can build it, and then you can try to make your own scales, because anybody can make their own scales now, and you can try to do ones like Wendy Carlos that don't participate exactly in the overtone series. In fact, the scale we always use is a little bit off. The octaves are perfect. The fifths are pretty much perfect. The other notes are not. And mm -hmm. that's the scale you grew up with. Right. So uh, you can try doing ones that don't have those low number harmonic ratios, but over at least 35,000 years, as you've seen, when we build instruments, that's what we're building them for. They're in essentially every culture uh, even, and they're even sung by birds, you know, a lot of songbirds and so on. So I, to come up with a hit using one of these kinds of scales that you're speculating about is going to be a real challenge. But I know that the people that are here listening to us at Harvard Bookstore are those kinds of arty intellectuals who really would like a challenge. And I know musicians and music lovers have great curiosity, energy, and creativity. And uh, that's my challenge to all of you, uh, and particularly to her. And uh, let's see what you come up with. It's going to be hard to have a hit. Hasn't happened for 35,000 years, but it's yeah. <laughs> one day it can happen. And it's good to you. 
Uh, well, thank you. This was uh, this this was great fun. This was a great way to to spend a Friday night. So thank you. Uh, thanks to all of you for for joining us. I reposted the link to purchase copies of the book and to learn more about it at uh, Harvard Bookstore. And on behalf of the bookstore, uh, and uh, and thank you so much to David. Uh, on behalf of the bookstore, have a good night. Stay safe. Keep reading. Thank you so Thanks much. Everyone, you can take your masks off to, as of yesterday. <laughs> Keep them on the bookstore, please. <laughs> in the bookstore. Still masks. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So much. Thank you, Nora. Thanks, everybody. Thank so long. You.